This week, the issue is Congress and the coronavirus. With us, California Congressman Adam Schiff, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee. Plus, our panel, streaming giant Hassan Piker on the left, Daily Wire's Michael Knowles on the right. The big debate, what role should government play in solving the pandemic crisis? And what do you see as your legacy? I'll look back at our unforgettable conversation with the late, great John Lewis. The issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. This week, California hit another record for number of coronavirus cases, the number of deaths in a single day. We now lead the nation in both cases and deaths. So what can Congress do to help? Joining us now from Capitol Hill is Congressman Adam Schiff, Democrat from Burbank, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee. Congressman Schiff, welcome back to The Issue Is. Thank you. Good to be with you. All right. So let's begin with this. In the first rounds of coronavirus relief, Congress passed that additional $600 a week in unemployment insurance. A lot of our viewers have come to rely on that. It's running out. What's the status on negotiations on what happens next there? Well, Democrats uh, passed a bill called the HEROES Act uh, weeks or even a couple months ago to extend that till the end of the year. Uh, the Republicans, though, haven't taken any action on it, and indeed, they don't seem to be able at this point to agree among themselves. Uh, they were supposed to unveil a bill of their own uh, earlier this week, and then at the end of the week, and they end up going home without unveiling anything. So uh, we don't have anyone to negotiate with, and the tragic thing is that we could all see this coming. Do you agree that that $600 a week thing should continue? Some say people are making more money with that than they are in their actual jobs, and it's a disincentive to work. Uh, you know, I've heard that argument. I think there are very few people uh, where $600 a week, that added bonus, gives them more than they would make by working. People want to go back to work. Um, and, but right now, this $600 is a lifeline to lots of people who cannot go back to work. Without getting too into the weeds, you and California Congresswoman Judy Chu have proposed some unemployment relief specifically for workers with what's called mixed income types. So explain what that is, how that would work, and is that going to pass? There's a subset of those uh, employees and workers who have mixed income. That is, they get some amount of traditional income from a W-2, and maybe it's a royalty payment. Um, but they would get most of their income as an independent contractor from a 1099. But because of a quirk in the law and the CARES Act, if you got some of both, you ended up getting little unemployment compensation, in some cases, none at all. Uh, and so I've introduced a bill with Judy that would solve this problem, we hope, uh, for those that, uh, that are being left out to make sure they too can get the unemployment compensation that they deserve. So on the unemployment issue more broadly, are we going to get a deal here? Well, we're going we're to get a deal, in my view, because we have to. I just cannot believe that, you know, half the members of Congress are going to say, you know, if you're unemployed, if you're one of the tens of millions newly unemployed, too bad for you. Let's take a moment to talk about the issue of election integrity, something you oversee with the Intelligence Committee. We know that Russia interfered in our last election. Are they doing the same now? Is North Korea is China. And is the Trump administration doing enough to stop that? Uh, Russia is interfering in our election again. Uh, this is a, a, a kind of an eerie and awful deja vu of four years ago. Uh, and the president is not doing enough to stop it. Uh, the message to Putin is as long as he interferes to help Donald Trump, Trump will never call him out on it and he may very well uh, applaud him for it. Uh, and that's dangerous. We should be exposing what the Russians are doing. Now, there are other countries that also do their best to influence the United States, uh, and we should expose those efforts too. But we shouldn't suggest that there's some false equivalence here between what Russia is doing and what other countries are doing. What Russia is doing is uniquely malevolent, uh, and it ought to be exposed. Let's talk for a moment about China. Uh, we saw the, the U.S. consulate uh, in Houston, uh, the Chinese consulate in Houston, shut down by the Trump administration. The State Department expressing a lot of concern there. Based off of the intelligence that you've seen, is that a good move? There's no question that we need to push back against China. What I'm concerned about, though, is that um, what the president appears to be doing is designed to pr uh, uh, 
create a conflict that he can use merely for political purposes. Uh, after all, it was just a couple months ago that the same China that was engaged in all these same activities, the president was praising. He was praising President Xi and what a great job he was doing and how transparent he was and how good he was handling the virus. Uh, and prior to that, he was begging China's president to help him in his re-election. Now, all of a sudden, completely different message from Donald Trump. Why? Because the first message wasn't helping him with his re-election. One of the things the administration has said when it comes to China is they've talked about the popular app TikTok, which so many of our viewers have on their phones right now. They're suggesting, the State Department suggesting this is, could be used by China for nefarious purpose. So based on what you've seen, is TikTok actually safe? And would you encourage your daughter to use it? Uh, no matter how that company may want to behave, if the Chinese government goes to TikTok and says, you will give me the personal information, everything you have that you've been able to gather through the use of this app, on these people, TikTok is by Chinese law required to comply. Uh, and so, yes, there are privacy concerns. There are privacy concerns with a lot of apps, but when you're dealing with a Chinese-owned uh, app, uh, a Chinese company, they are under a legal obligation to give Chinese intelligence or the Chinese government uh, whatever they ask for, and that is a concern. So would you use it? Do you think it's safe? Would you tell your family to use it? Well, I, what I have told my family, and, uh, and I think my kids do use it, uh, is they need to be very careful about what personal information they share uh, because they need to assume it will not be kept private. So I guess we're not going to be seeing a dancing video of you anytime soon? <laughs> you know, for many reasons. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the, the danger the Chinese would get a hold of it is probably very low on the list. Yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> One uh, election question here. Uh, there are some in your party that are now urging Joe Biden not to debate President Trump, saying that Biden has a lead, debate's a big risk, the president's too unpredictable. What do you think? Should he bow out of the debates? Uh, you know, there's a long tradition of presidential debates that I think should continue. Uh, I think they're good for the country to be able to compare the candidates. So I would like to see uh, debates. Uh, that would be my recommendation. Uh, but the campaign hasn't come to me for that advice. And uh, finally this week, we, we are remembering John Lewis, the congressman. You wrote a beautiful post on your Facebook remembering your friend. Uh, you know, all of us have seen John Lewis the myth. Talk to us for a moment about John Lewis the man. Well, John Lewis uh, was a wonderful, warm, gentle spirit. Uh, I never saw him say anything uh, in anger. Um, and uh, I'll tell you one of my favorite memories of John, frankly, is I had the opportunity as part of a small group to go to see the play All the Way about LBJ and the Civil Rights Movement with John. Uh, the play was wonderful. Brian Cranston was amazing. But what was more wonderful was watching the audience react when it learned that John Lewis was in their presence. Mm. And he was rightly referred to as the conscience of the Congress, uh, and indeed uh, he was. Uh, Congressman, great to see you. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate you sharing your views. My pleasure, thank you. Up next, things about to get heated. The issue is debate returns. Hassan Piker on the left, Michael Knowles on the right. As we go to break, a reminder to log on to our website, by the way, theissueisshow.com. Get more content there as well as our podcast. We'll be right back. Working with tenants groups and, um, and uh, property owners, apartment owners uh, and the like, large and small owners to see what we can do. California Governor Gavin Newsom announces possible changes to rent regulations coming this week. Our big debate, a broader look at the role of government in dealing with this global pandemic. I don't know if I'm quite ready for this, but here we go. Here's our panel this week. Two men who are almost the exact same age, who are both very savvy online, both live close to each other physically, but live on different planets ideologically. <laughs> <laughs> San Piker is one of the most followed progressive minds on the entire internet. He was previously known as the youngest of young Turks. Now you can watch him stream virtually nonstop at twitch.tv slash Hasanabi. Here he is recently breaking down President Trump's interview with Chris Wallace on Fox News. 
Michael Knowles is one of the most followed young conservatives on the planet. He hosts the Michael Knowles Show on the Daily Wire Network, which was started by Ben Shapiro. He co-hosts The Verdict with Ted Cruz podcast, which is one of the most listened to podcasts in the country. Here they are interviewing Attorney General Bill Barr recently. Gentlemen, welcome. Hopefully we can keep it respectful and focus on the issues, not the personal stuff. <laughs> All right, so. That works for me. Nice yeah. to see you, Alex. All right, let's start with the role of government. Hassan, in responding to coronavirus, should we be doing more in terms of government than we're doing right now? What do you see as the role of government right now? I think that the government has fallen short in nearly every capacity. And then, of course, we need to be doing more. I don't even understand what we could potentially do less than what we have done thus far, uh, whether it's a moratorium on rent or an abolition of rent for the time being even, uh, that also accompanied uh, potentially some uh, moratoriums on uh, mortgages as well, make it easier on the homeowners on top of everything else, and then uh, beefing up our unemployment payment uh, system. Well, I, I actually have to agree with Hassan that I think the government's handled this abysmally, although, as you might expect, for different reasons. It, it's true, people can't pay their rent. They can't pay their rent because they've been <laughs> mandated not to go into work. The, the trouble is there actually isn't enough money to solve that. So we, we've now spent $6 trillion in the United States at, at the federal level to get us through four months of this virus. If my math is, is right, that means it would take us $18 trillion at least to get through just one year. And at the rate GDP is going, that would overwhelm even GDP. You could take all the money that we make in the United States, give it all for coronavirus relief, we still wouldn't have enough. The only way that we can possibly get out of this is to reopen the country. But unfortunately, this has become a political issue. Frankly, I think it's been a political issue from the very beginning. Obviously, I'm also in support of reopening the economy. I think every single sane person wants to at least go back to normalcy, uh, if for no reason other than that. But uh, the problem is reopening the economy safely. And unfortunately, on that metric, we have fallen short. It's just the problem is there are a lot of actors, I guess, both on the left and right, uh, but I believe predominantly on the right, that are making it harder for us to reopen by uh, elongating the suffering, by refusing to wear masks, refusing to social distance, and turning it into a political culture war. Michael, you've suggested that, that wearing masks has become a political issue. You've suggested that President yeah. Trump, by saying to wear masks, was conceding some sort of defeat. What do you say to people like Hassan who are saying, the science on this is clear? I mean, even Ben Shapiro, your boss, has said wearing a mask in a crowd is a good idea. Well, I would agree with Hassan and others that, that say that we have to listen to the science, and I would agree that the science is clear, but it doesn't say what political activists are saying that it says, even some on the right. I've got the CDC right here. Paper went up in the CDC May 2020. Uh, this was an analysis of uh, randomized controlled trials. It showed that although mechanistic studies support the potential effect of hand hygiene or face masks, evidence from 14 randomized controlled trials of these measures did not support a substantial effect on transmission of viruses so, so but what hasn't that but that was that was in but michael of michael that was in Fauci may said. that was in may um, has so, it not been updated since then it hasn't been updated since then and what we know is going back even far further back than may we saw dr fauci tell us that wearing masks was more or less a social placebo it actually didn't do very much and you see this with someone like dr fauci who throws out the first pitch at the nationals game and he's wearing a mask 60 feet away on the pitcher's mound then he's sitting six inches away from his friends in the stands and he takes the mask off um what do you have to say to numerous empirical studies that have been conducted that show the transmission rates uh decrease by up to 70 percent when uh, when people use masks and also social distance on top of that. What I'm failing to recognize here is that Anthony Fauci has corrected himself and said that the reason why he originally had said that masks are a social placebo for the most part is because they were worried about the lack of PPE in this country due to the unfortunately fragile supply chain that we have with our over-reliance on manufacturing, specifically in China. It's actually, you make a very apt point here, which is you're saying the reason that Fauci and other people said what they said about the masks was basically they were lying to us to preserve the masks for the healthcare workers and not, you know, the rest of us peasants out here it, where, where it doesn't matter if we get the virus. The, the issue is the credibility. If he lied to us then, how can we possibly trust him now? And you're saying Anthony Fauci changed his position, but he clearly didn't because even though he may say that he changed his position, just the other day he was photographed when he thought no All one right, was so looking, sitting very closely next to people, not wearing the mask. So are, so are you going to base... Yeah. 
an entire you, public you health policy you, based off of one photo in one moment and negate sort of everything else that's been said? I mean, the, the head of the CDC said, if you wear your mask, 90% uh, of the country wears its mask, we can get this thing under control in six to eight weeks. Do you think that right. that was a political statement and that was BS? I think it's become highly politicized. It's not just one photo. There have been multiple photos of these public health experts doing this very same thing. Obviously, we have the, the point from the CDC website, but then further, the public health establishment, you had a letter, an open letter signed by over a thousand so-called public health officials during the BLM protests and riots saying that the virus would spread during right-wing protests, but not spread during left-wing protests. The people who are telling us to wear the masks, the so-called experts we say we defer to, have no credibility left. So do you wear a mask when you're out in a crowd? I wear a mask if I am going into a, a restaurant or a house and someone, a friend or, or a relative, asks me to. I'll do it to be polite. Or if I'm mandated to, to go pick up my Chinese food for dinner. But when I'm walking around the streets or, or walking around the city, I, I certainly do not. I like the sunshine and I like the fresh air. And, I, and I've been just fine so far. <laughs> okay. Um, obviously, uh, your personal anecdotes of mask wearing uh, would not substitute for empirical evidence, which you are avoiding and only hyper focusing on one CDC letter from three months ago. Once again, no, um, it's, a, it's, a, as, it's a paper that just as came opposed out. to the worldwide scientific consensus at this stage about mask wearing and its efficacy, which we don't even need to talk about. And I will address the BLM point of view if you would like to. But that's not the conversation we're having. The conversation we're currently having is about, again, the efficiency of masks and how helpful they are in stopping the further spread of coronavirus. All right, let's pause for there. Let's take a deep breath. <laughs> when we come back, okay. we're going to talk about the federal agents in the streets of Portland. Is this a good or bad thing? And could we be seeing something like that here in California soon? Stay with us. He's a mayor. So that was the moment when the mayor of Portland was hit by tear gas in the middle of his city. Federal agents moved in, even though local officials didn't ask them to. President Trump has suggested there could be similar actions in other cities coming, including a city here in California. And all of these, Oakland is a mess. We're not going to let this happen in our country. So back with our panel now, Hassan Piker on the left, Michael Knowles on the right. Michael, you usually advocate for states' rights. Do you like federal troops in the streets of Portland? Do you think that something like this is necessary maybe in a place like Oakland? But to put down an insurrection, absolutely, we do need to get federal officials here. I mean, this is part of what the DHS was founded to do, was to protect federal property, and, and they were they were assailing this federal courthouse. But also, the, the, our very Constitution is sort of based on this kind of thing. You know, this goes all the way back to 1787, Shays' Rebellion. Uh, the uh, criticism of the Articles of Confederation is that they didn't give the federal government sufficient power to pa put down an insurgency. That is, in large part, why we got the Constitutional Convention. If you were playing the drinking game for the issue is, and you had Shay's Rebellion take a shot now. <laughs> <laughs> Hassan, uh, let's, let's go to you, your, your response to this, these scenes. Oh, I think this is horrific. The, the idea that we have uh, unmarked par paramilitary troops at the federal level violating the Constitution and also violating our rule of law that is supposed to protect citizens, especially in a circumstance where they are exercising their First Amendment rights, is... Uh, Disgusting, but also expected from the Trump administration. I think Trump is scrambling to uh, win as many people as he possibly can because everyone is hyper-focused currently on the ongoing devastating pandemic, which has taken more than 130,000 lives. Let's take a moment uh, to briefly talk about the election itself. The biggest decision Joe Biden has left for this campaign is who he's going to pick for vice president. Uh, there's a lot of talk recently about two Californians, Congresswoman Karen Bass, Senator Kamala Harris, who've both been on this show. Uh, Hassan, who do you think? Who should he pick for, for vice president? I don't care. I, I, I truly don't care. I, I, it doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter. Most of these uh, officials are going to do exactly what is best for uh, they are, whichever industry is backing them. I want Biden to pick Hassan. I think, uh, Hassan, age requirements notwithstanding would be a great pick. And I, I mean that actually somewhat sincerely, because I think you, Hassan, are speaking much more to young left-wing voters than the Democratic Party is. But I think it would be much more honest than the Democrats who are trying to hide what they believe. <laughs> Do 
<laughs> I wish the Democrats were, I guess, uh, as radical as you think they are, or at least listen to their base of support. And just to wrap things up, Hassan, I, I will take Michael's um, tongue in cheek endorsement of you as vice president as his compliment of you. Do you, you have a, a compliment of, of Michael in, in the in the feeling of, of good feelings and showing bipartisanship and reaching out to each other? Um, Michael is a great studio. I, I, I wish I, uh, <laughs> I wish I could get out. <laughs> It is a nice setup. Uh, so props to the, uh, the Daily Wire team for that. Um, thank you both for coming on, uh, having a respectful debate of ideas. I think it's important for people on both sides to hear the other side. And uh, you both um, have great audiences in that sense and I think are articulate, smart guys. And we appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Alex. Right, thanks, for, thanks for having us. Thank you very much. All right, coming up next right here, we're going to talk about John Lewis, our tribute to him. And as we go to break, we want to show this moment from the Late Show with Stephen Colbert when the congressman got to crowd surf. My interview with him when we come back. There are forces trying to take us back mm -hmm. to another time and another place. Back in 2018, I got the chance to meet Congressman John Lewis at the Community Coalition in South L.A. with Congresswoman Karen Bass. It was for the second ever episode of The Issue Is, and it was one of the more profound experiences of my professional life. Next week, Congressman Lewis will lie in state at the Capitol. America will have a chance to pay its respects to a civil rights icon that made our country more compassionate, fair, and equal. When we spoke... Lewis was most focused on the young people in the crowd. And we leave you this week with his own words. Thanks for watching The Issue Is, and thank you, Congressman, for the inspiration. What do you think Dr. King would think of this particular moment in history? Dr. King would say, be brave, be courageous, be bold, stand up, speak up, and speak out and help redeem the soul of America. What do you see as your legacy, as the lesson you want everybody to take from your life that you pass on to all these kids? I said to young people, and people not so young, I just try to help out. I just try to help out. Try to make a contribution. Thank you all very, very, very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.